This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. We had begun our jury selection process this morning, but I've been informed that there is a change of plea. For the second time in as many days, a lawyer for Donald Trump took a plea on Friday in a case accusing the former president and 18 others of racketeering as part of a scheme to keep Trump in power after he lost the 2020 election. How do you plead to count 15 conspiracy to commit filing false documents in indictment number 23 SC 188947? Guilty. Kenneth Chesbrough's plea to one felony charge came as jury selection was getting underway in the trial, and a day after fellow attorney Sidney Powell entered her own guilty plea to six misdemeanor counts. The two guilty pleas, along with a third from a bail bondsman last month, are victories for Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis. The question is, how significant? Here to answer that question is Michael Moore of Moore Hall, the former U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Georgia. So, Michael, just how significant are these three pleas? Well, any time that there is a plea agreement where co-defendants agree to testify against a key defendant, that's a big deal. But when you look at this indictment and you look at the charges and then specifically the defendants who have pled guilty, I'm not sure that this gets the DA much further down the road, and really this is why. The charges that Sidney Powell pled to were basically dealing with the Coffee County issue and that part of the state and whether or not somebody accessed some voting machines down there to do a review and whether or not that was proper. I'm not sure anybody will ever be able to put that directly back on the former president. When you look at the Chesbro plea, he pleaded guilty to charges surrounding the fake electors. And remember, it was really his legal memos that sort of set up the idea of using this alternate slate of electors. And so I think the former president would be able to say, I relied on his advice and he told me what to do. And, you know, he was a lawyer and, you know, this kind of thing. And they've done it in Hawaii and it is different, but I just don't know how far that goes. So there is some significance and I think it's always useful information. You know, you think about a puzzle, you have to put all the pieces together to see it. This is simply a couple of pieces that I think the DA will have access to. It may, frankly, become more useful to the federal prosecution, given what we know about that case. And in that case, it's a much more tailored type prosecution with Trump as the defendant. And there may be some information that Ms. Powell has about individual meetings that she had with the former president to give some some context to some of the allegations that the special counsel is making. So I don't think it was necessarily a game changer for Fulton County, but it may be useful in Washington in that case. Okay, I have a lot of questions. The first is, so for Bonnie Willis, was it really critical to avoid going to trial with these two defendants and showcasing Mm -hmm. her evidence to Trump? So was it more about that than it was about the evidence they specifically might have? I think so. I mean, if you look at the idea of having to put a case on to preview the case and the the complete book of evidence, if you will, for a, a more critical defendant, I don't think there was any question that she didn't want to do that uh, in this case. And so to the extent that these two defendants filed for some relief under the Speedy Trial Act in the state of Georgia, which meant their case had to be tried and started at least, uh, jury selected in October, I think that put the DA a little bit under the gun. And these were not two defendants with the greatest cases that she wanted to go with first. So what we saw then is a plea offer made, and it's not uncommon for people to make plea offers. That's sort of just playbook stuff for prosecutors, but we saw a plea offer made that really was pretty insignificant. What we saw obviously were misdemeanor pleas for Ms. Powell and a felony plea dealing with filing a paper and preparing a paper for Mr. Chesbro. Both receiving probation, both apparently being able to maintain their first offender status, and so they'll have no criminal conviction at all. Both could vote, they both could have a gun. You know, those kinds of things that we think about often following a criminal conviction, those won't be in place for them. So to think about this as um, that these were the architects or the masterminds, if you will, of the big election scheme and the fraud, the big lie, the sentence of probation was pretty meager, especially then when you stack that up against the sentences that we've seen for some of the January the 6th defendants who, while clearly that was, at least in my opinion, I mean, an insurrection effort and an effort to go in and, and wreak havoc in the Capitol. But you're seeing many, many of them get jail time. But yet the people who came up or who were responsible, at least, for the theories and the stories that may have been the catalyst for that day, 
they're getting misdemeanor probated sentences. So it, it seems a lot, and that tells me that it was likely that the DA did not want this to be the case that she put forward first. It also tells me that now the judge will have another, he had blocked off, I believe, five months for the trial. This gives some ability for them to maneuver and try to put, if they can squeeze, another group of defendants in somewhere in the first half of next year. I think you'll, you'll see some effort to do that. Sidney Powell did have a lot of contact, direct contact, mm -hmm. with Trump, including that infamous Oval Office <laughs> meeting where there was screaming on December 18th of 2020. So wouldn't she be called at least to testify about her contacts with Trump? I think so, and I think she would do that in accordance with the terms of any type of plea agreement. The question will be, what information does she give that's helpful, really, to prove in the rest of the prosecution's case? And so she may say, yes, I was at the meeting, and I was given my advice, and people did agree with my advice, and it became heated. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a criminal charge. So I think she's looking at, and they're probably considering her as being a witness to, again, sort of give context to what happened without necessarily being a key co-defendant. Think about a bank robbery case, and... You send your your accomplice out to buy the guns while you go steal the car that's going to be the getaway car. Then you meet back at a certain place and you go in and rob the bank. Well, clearly, there's great testimony to be had by one defendant there against the other about what their role may have been. I don't know, and frankly, we just don't know because there are parts of this case that we don't have a complete vision to yet, but we don't know how much information she has to directly sort of point the finger at Trump. There may be other people in the campaign. There may be other people that were there at that meeting. There may be other folks who she had contact with about, you know, we're going to look at these election machines, and that information could be relevant, but it may not be sort of the silver bullet that folks thought it might be. Chesbro's lawyer said his client had agreed to testify against other co-defendants, but he would be surprised if he were called as a witness in any future case. He didn't snitch on anyone. He simply decided it was time for him to put this behind him and go on with his life. I mean, he didn't snitch on anyone? Well, that can be. And I mean, so somebody can plead to, a, to an act. They can plead to conduct and say, yes, I did this. And while I may not have believed that was wrong, you're telling me, government, that was wrong. I, I did the conduct. So you're charging me with doing the act. So in this case, doing the paperwork or whatever for the alternate electors. So I did that. If you're saying that's wrong, yes, I did it. And rather than go to trial, I'll, I'll enter some plea and I'll testify that, in fact, I did it. But it doesn't mean that that person has to have changed their mind or changed their theory about why they did it. So you oftentimes see defendants say, well, the government's got me. I did this, in fact. I did what they're saying. I had my own reasons for it, but this is what I, I did it. And I do want to put this behind me. I don't know how it could be that he, I mean, he may not have snitched directly on somebody, but I think his testimony could come in and be problematic for defendants, certainly. So he may not have said, well, John Doe and I went to the printer and printed these things off. You know, that would be directly snitching on John Doe. But he may talk about the calls that he made, the efforts that he had, the discussions that he had to sort of implement this alternate slate of electors. And at that point, then it's up to the trier of fact, which will likely be a jury, to decide whether or not those other defendants did what they did, based in part, at least, upon some testimony that Mr. Chesbrough might give. I was wondering if Chesbrough's testimony would actually be more dangerous for John Eastman or Rudy Giuliani, the other lawyers in the case. It could. I mean, and, and I thought his case was particularly unusual in the sense that you did have a lawyer charged with criminal conduct for writing legal memorandum. And I think that can be problematic and maybe a, a foreboding sign to other lawyers who are charged in the case. You know, simply because somebody has pled guilty doesn't mean that they now believe that the election was completely legitimate. And I think that's maybe what people are thinking when they think about the import of these particular pleas. Like somehow these folks have had a, you know, come to Jesus moment and have decided that everything they've ever done was wrong and it was all, you know, all for naught. And so they're entering their plea. That may not, in fact, be the case. They're required to acknowledge their criminal conduct or conduct in a criminal case, but they're not necessarily required to give up personally held beliefs. And so it may become, it may very well become a fine line for a prosecutor to walk on whether or not I decide to call this witness because they may say something that rings true with some potential juror, or they may say something that puts a cloud over 
my allegations against another defendant, you know, that type of thing. And so that's why I say that, I mean, it's, it's always significant to have co-defendants plea, but it's not necessarily the end of the case by any stretch of the imagination. Coming up, we'll talk about the implications for the federal case. This is Bloomberg. Attorney Kenneth Chesbro pleaded guilty to a felony on Friday just as jury selection was getting underway in his trial on charges accusing him of participating in efforts to overturn Donald Trump's loss in the 2020 election in Georgia. His plea came a day after fellow attorney Sidney Powell, who'd been scheduled to go to trial alongside him, entered her own guilty plea to six misdemeanor counts. I've been talking to Michael Moore of Moore Hall. You mentioned the special counsel's case. These two are also co-conspirators. I think it's three and five in the special counsel's Mm -hmm. election interference case. Do you think Mm -hmm. the defense has been in touch with the special counsel? I mean, do you plead in a state case when you have exposure in a federal case? I would think there has had to have been some discussions. I mean, but I also think there had to have been some discussions between state prosecutors and federal prosecutors. You know, that's been pretty much disavowed that they had any discussions. That strikes me as strange and, frankly, out of the norm. So I, I would hope and expect that there was some discussion about how these defendants would move forward in the face of sort of the second axe that was hanging over their head, and that being the federal case. So I do think, I mean, they may be called to give testimony. And one thing to remember is they are on probation, and they're on state probation here. Well, one thing you can't do while you're on probation is commit other crimes. And so it would be a fool's errand for them to go out and try to give perjured testimony or false testimony in another court proceeding, especially one in a federal court somewhere. Do you think the special counsel will try to give them a deal or will end up indicting them based on what they've pleaded to here? It would not surprise me if he simply tried to give them some immunity for some testimony. And I I say that because it seems apparent to me the problems that have been created by having a huge case with this many defendants in Georgia under this RICO case. And I think you saw Jack Smith's case, the special counsel's case, more narrowly tailored. And I think he recognizes, you know, I don't necessarily need to put all the minnows in the sea if I'm just going after the big fish in my case. And and I think that's, that's what we're seeing. So I expect that they will use the leverage they have over these defendants because of their probation and otherwise to get them to give truthful testimony. I also think you may hear him at some point acknowledge some type of arrangement for their testimony that he's made through their lawyers. I've heard a lot that, you know, flipping encourages, more flipping encourages, more flipping. Do you buy that, that after these three we're going to see more? I think we're going to see more, but I don't know that I attribute it just because somebody flipped. I mean, you know, typically when you start flipping people on the low end, there's not a lot. It's like tipping over the dominoes at the end of the line. You know, there's just not a lot of movement after that. But when you do tip a domino over that's, you know, near the front of the line, that can make a difference for for folks further down. You may see a few people plea, but I mean, frankly, I I really think that it was the idea that, you know, and if I were advising these particular defendants, it would have been, look, can you admit to this conduct? They're asking you to admit to it. The answer is yes. You're getting a misdemeanor. You know, that's basically like a, a speeding ticket in Georgia. You know, they, they may be stacked on top of each other, and you're going to get 12 months probation for each one. And, but it's a misdemeanor in Ms. Powell's case. In Mr. Chesbro's case, you know, it, it's a felony, but you're not going to have a record because you can avail yourself of certain first offender protections and that type of thing. And so, you know, you can get this behind you. I mean, the fines were nominal. I mean, they got to write a letter of apology. I mean, you know, this kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't know that that's a, that was something that I feel like particularly compelling in the deal, but okay. And so it really was by all standards, I think, a good deal for these defendants if, uh, to be able to basically turn the page on this chapter. And so I, I don't know that other defendants may get the same type of offer. I, I think the strategic move to file the speedy trial demand played into the decision here and the fact that this case was going to have to be tried. I think all of this stuff was in the mix. And the state was willing to essentially let these two go. And frankly, too, because I I think it was a tougher case when you have lawyers sitting as defendants. You have unique legal defenses that can be raised and those things that the state would may not want to deal with at this point of the case, especially when they're looking at other counsel like Eastman, Giuliani, that type of thing. So then you think, bottom line, Trump doesn't have that much more to fear because these two flipped. Well, like I said, kind of at the outset, it's never a good day or a defendant to have his or her co-defendants flip and start entering guilty pleas. And Trump has been sort of masterful in the way he has controlled 
I think some witnesses and, and potential co-defendants, both by paying legal fees and you know raising money for them, doing this kind of thing, and that is one way I think he's trying to kind of keep his thumb on folks. But so I do think he always has something to fear, and I think he has to be thinking at this point. You know, I hope this is the end. I don't think these folks are going to hurt me, but I still need to be aware of the possibility that other people who I may not have as much influence with, they may in fact decide you know that they're going to come forward with some other you know, some of the more damning testimony. Ms. Powell's charges were so limited in the indictment. And, you know, this was a very thorough indictment. And had they had some additional overt acts, had they had some additional predicate acts that it impacted her, I think we would have seen that spelled out in the DA's case. But the allegations that they made against Ms. Powell were sort of specific as it related to this incident in, in Coffee County, Georgia. The allegations against Mr. Chesbro, of course, dealt with a very sort of nuanced position relating to the alternate electors. Again, both somewhat removed, I think, from the former president. You know, there'll be a unique argument, I think, that we'll, we'll hear, and it'll be a defense. I think you may be seeing it somewhat now from Trump saying that he wasn't represented by Sidney Powell. Yes, he started uh, we, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we may have, in fact, now, we may be seeing sort of the technical niceties of who is the actual client. Is it Trump as an individual, is it, or is it the Trump campaign, of which Trump is not named as an individual, or is it you know, another organization? And so we, we may start seeing those maneuverings as well. It'll, it'll be interesting to see who, for instance, Ms. Powell says she was representing at a particular time. Yeah, I was wondering when he said that she didn't represent him. So where does that put his advice of counsel defense? I mean, also, if all these people are pleading mm-hmm. all his attorneys are pleading on him or almost yeah i think that's a great that's a great question and i think it is also maybe indicative of some of the problems that we may see prosecutors have down the road or jurors have as they think about the case the evidence in the case and ultimately appellate courts on when you charge a president who basically is a person sitting in an office that's getting advice from everybody lawyers non-lawyers cabinet people chiefs of staff you know but the lawyers are coming in telling them what to do does that mean he can't readily rely on that for fear that he may, they didn't represent him individually, but they represented something, somebody that he may have been associated with or a group he, he may have been associated with. Does that mean that he loses that defense? I don't think he does because I think sort of the executive privilege umbrella is made, in fact, to sort of cover this very situation where you have advice coming from different people. So, But it's a great point, and I think, again, it's relevant because of the unique nature of this case and bringing charges, especially the state charges, against a former president for conduct that occurred while he was a sitting president of the United States, enjoying, in fact, that privilege. So that's a question that I think you may find nine folks sitting on a a nice bench in Washington, D.C., making a decision about it some point. <laughs> Sounds about right. Thanks so much, Michael. That's Michael Moore of Moore Hall, the former U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Georgia. Coming up next, migrant numbers are reaching new highs at the southern border. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. From day one, this administration has made clear that a border wall is not the answer. That remains our position, and our position has never wavered. Despite that statement from Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas about two weeks ago, the Biden administration has made the confusing decision to build up to 20 miles of border wall authorized during the Trump administration. President Biden is also asking Congress for $11 billion for border security and migration matters as part of the $100 billion request to support Israel and Ukraine. The migration challenges facing the U.S. are increasing, with record numbers of migrants at the southern border. Arrests for illegal crossings were up 21 percent last month to 219,000. Joining me is immigration law expert Leon Fresco, a partner at Holland and Knight. There were more migrant encounters last month than in any month last year. So whatever the Biden administration is doing is not working, is it? No, unfortunately, the problem is everything happens through a sort of trial and error experimentation process. And when people saw that at the end of the day, the legal pathways were taking too long, and even though there are legal pathways, and it's good to give the Biden administration credit for the two legal pathways they created, which is number one, a parole program that allows you to apply online. And if you are from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, Venezuela, 
you can potentially win one of 30,000 monthly slots to come in or what's called the CBT one app appointment system where you actually show up in an orderly fashion for the port of entry. Those are great new innovations, but because each of them takes too long and is not guaranteed to actually lead to either an appointment or a slot, people have decided to take matters into their own hands. And the consequences of doing that are insignificant because just the fact that you're banned from asylum 10 years from now when your case finally gets to immigration court doesn't seem to matter to people because they can still, A, get something called withholding of removal, which is less than asylum, but allows them to stay, but B, some significant percentage of this group isn't looking to actually show up to immigration court at the end of the day, but is just looking to be in America and bide their time. And so from that perspective, that's what we're seeing. We're now seeing that that trial and error period has failed, and people realize that the, uh, the unlawful route is still the route, unfortunately, that pays the best dividend. In his address last Thursday, President Biden said he'd be requesting $100 billion in emergency aid for the southern border and international allies facing crises. What would that be used for? And is that just a drop in the bucket in this problem? The problem is that all of the money that goes down to the southern border doesn't change the legal framework of things. It goes toward the more expedited housing processing and transferring into the interior of the country of the people who make a credible asylum claim. And so that's the problem is at the end of the day, that money is really going to make the process smoother But people are complaining that the point of this is not to make the process smoother. It's to try to actually make it so that only people with the most credible possible asylum cases actually end up entering the interior of the United States. And that money can't go to that because the law doesn't permit that at the moment. The law says if you articulate any credible fear of asylum, you have to be let into the interior of the country. And so all that this money does is get that initial processing period faster and more efficiently handled for people. Leon, you know, in the law, everything's subject to interpretation. So could the interpretation of what is a credible fear be changed to require more? So what happens is that does happen to a degree. And so you've seen over the course of, I would say, the last decade, depending on when these crises get worse or better, they issue these memos that basically re-articulate in a sort of subtle manner, dear uh, USCIS asylum officers, a credible fear does not include this, it includes this, et cetera. And the problem is that that moves the needle at, let's say, instead of 80% of the claims being successful, We now see there's actually been a reduction, 60 percent of the claims being successful. But we're talking about 60 percent of 200,000 people coming into the country. And so people won't feel that numerically because it's still 140,000 people, which if you were to do that on an annualized basis, is still nearly two million people. And so that's the problem that they're running up against is. They actually are dialing it up as much as possible, but even within that confine, unless you were to do something illegal and just start wholeheartedly banning people, saying that nobody's claim is credible, people generally are coached to say the right words that will articulate the credible fear claim for whatever country they're from. And so it's very hard to shut it down completely. But you have seen it dialed up. But again, you're dialing it up from a percentage standpoint of a much larger numerator. And so 80% of 100,000 was still less than 60% of 200,000. Let's turn to the H-1B visas, which allow employers to add foreign workers with specialized skills for up to two to three years with options to extend the status further when visa holders are in the process of applying for permanent residency. So demand on that program has far exceeded the 85,000 new visas that are available annually. Registrations for the annual lottery exceeded 740,000 
for 2024. Tell us about the changes that the Department of Homeland Security is proposing. Well, the main change that they're going to implement is that when this lottery system was established, in the, it was, the lottery system has been around for quite a while, but the lottery system used to just be a one-for-one one situation where one company would apply for one employee because it was too expensive for multiple companies to apply for the same employee because you had, you actually had to put in the entire visa application package and support evidence and affidavits and everything else. And that was about a $10,000 expense for employers. So multiple employers didn't want to do that for the same person. But the Trump administration changed this process and said, instead of having to put the whole application in up front, just put your name, address, date, passport number, very simple data. And then if you win, we'll ask you to come forward and put in the entire 300 page application, the onerous process. Okay, that's great and it sounds efficient, but everything has trade offs in life. And so what happened was because it became so easy and so cheap to put in applications, what happened was companies, not the larger tech companies, not the Googles and Intels and Cisco's of the world, but the sort of smaller tech companies that might have 50, 100 employees that are the sort of, you know, family owned type tech companies decided to basically pool their resources together and form maybe blocks of 100, 200 companies where they would all apply for the exact same list of 10,000 workers from India, let's say. And then however those workers ended up getting selected from whichever companies, they just transfer them to end up getting an even number of workers for the company. But so that was radically gaming the system. And it was creating many, many more applications that were actually naturally desired. And so what this change does is this change says you can only apply for a person one time, meaning that person only has one chance to win the lottery. They don't have 50 different chances to win the lottery. But from there, then they can go to any of the employers that express an interest to them which will ultimately then give them more bargaining power vis-a-vis their ability to say, okay, I just won a lottery slot. So if you want to have me because I've won a lottery slot, you can have me pick amongst the employers which one you want. So it's changed the balance from the employers rigging the system to now a more employee-based chance to be a free agent, so to speak. I guess we'll have to wait and see if it changes the gaming of the system. New York City has struggled to deal with the arrival of more than 120,000 asylum seekers in the past year. About 60,000 are currently in shelters run by the city, which is legally required to provide emergency housing to homeless people. Mayor Eric Adams announced in July that New York City would start giving adult migrants 60 days notice to move out of city shelters. And about 3,000 asylum seekers have been told their time was up in the shelters, but about half have reapplied to stay. I've been talking to Leon Fresco, a partner at Holland and Knight. What else can Adams do? This is where, as heartbreaking as people, you know, don't want to do these types of things, The actual answer for this, as it has always been in the history of America until six months ago, for whatever reason, is that if a person does not have a fixed address and doesn't have a place where the government can actually keep track of them, those individuals have to go into INS or ICE now, it's not INS, but I just being colloquial for your listeners, ICE custody so that their hearings can go quickly and they can either succeed or not succeed. But those people shouldn't be in shelters. They shouldn't be homeless. They shouldn't be in the middle of the street. The only people who should be leaving ICE custody are people who have a fixed address and someone who's willing to take, quote unquote, ownership or custody of the person to make sure that they'll show up to court and do the things they need to do. And really, if we're talking about more money for the Department of Homeland Security, that's what it should be going for. And we're not saying that people need to be in a prison. Nobody needs to do that. But you have to have them in a facility where they can't leave and where their case can then be adjudicated quickly so that at that point, then either they get to stay and they can start working immediately and they're not a drain on the society, 
Or if they don't have an asylum claim, they can be repatriated back to their home country. But that would be the federal government doing that, right? That is true. But Adams, I have not heard him say, I take the people into custody from my shelters. I think he knows he'd be killed politically for saying that. But that's what he needs to say. And that's going to be the only solution to this problem is, is if you don't leave this shelter, you're going into ICE custody. So you would need two things. You would need Adams to push for this, and you would need then ICE to agree to it. But even if ICE doesn't agree to it, just Adams pushing for it at least solves the problem from his perspective because he can say, this is what needs to happen. This is what has traditionally happened. I'm not being cruel. Everybody who has come into America for decades has known if you don't have a fixed address or a fixed sponsor, you can't expect to be let out of immigration custody. And New York City is challenging that right to shelter and trying to get the requirements suspended. And apparently there are negotiations going on in court. And from the standpoint of let's say they succeed, so what? So now the people are let out in the shelter and they're out on the street. That doesn't solve much. And so that's why the point is ICE needs to, at the front, end not release people, and that's the conversation Adam now has to have on the back end, which is if you did release people and now we can't house them, then ICE has to come back and have a conversation with these people. Do you really, 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 really not have someone in the United States that can sponsor you? Because if you're not, then we're going to have to put you back in immigration custody. Mayor Adams also traveled to Mexico, apparently with the aim of telling would-be migrants not to come to New York City. Do those kinds of trips and pleas ever work? Here's the problem. That message of don't come to America, the trek is too dangerous, isn't working because that's not the world we live in anymore. It's not 2000. It's not 2005. Right now, people are getting real-time information on their phone that has the exact questions the CBP is asking, which locations on any given day are staffed less or more, which positions, which times of day you should come into, where's the least way to get into the country. And with all of that, people understand these are the ways to safely enter the United States. And a politician saying don't come in is not going to have any relevance to those individuals. What will have relevance are the real-time reports people are receiving And there's no way now in 2023 to block those real-time reports. So the only way to change the infrastructure of what's happening in the border is to actually change the manner in which people are being processed and have that word get out that, look, spending $15,000 is not leading anywhere because you're only stuck in detention or you're only being put out into Mexico while you wait for your case to be decided. But if the result they hear is, you're allowed to enter the United States without any conditions other than to show up to court months from now, that's not going to deter anyone. And we're sure to hear more and more about immigration issues as campaigning picks up next year. Thanks so much, Leon. That's Leon Fresco of Holland and Knight. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news on our Bloomberg Law podcast. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at www.bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. And remember to tune into the Bloomberg Law Show every weeknight at 10 p.m. Wall Street time. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. Bloomberg.